you guys. It's good to have you here tonight. Uh, thanks, thanks for being with us. Um, Butch is going to come tonight and read our opening scripture. So if you would stand with me, we'll go ahead and get started. Butch, thank you. Butch. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'll be reading from uh, the New King James Version. John chapter 14, hear the word of the Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are, where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide in you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live in you, you will also. I'm sorry, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise and let us go from here.
For you to be glorified, for you to be lifted Make us one, Father, Spirit, Son. We want, we want to be just like you. Your glory is enough. Find us with your love. We want, we want to be just like you. Make us one, Father, Spirit, Son. We want, we want to be just like you. Glory is enough. Find us with your love. We want, we want to be just like you. Holy Spirit, 
wash and cleanse us with your blood so we see through the eyes of love revive us revive us revive us revive us Wash and cleanse us with your blood, so we see through the eyes of love. Unite us, unite us, unite us, unite us. Wash and cleanse us with your blood, so we see through the eyes of love. Revive us, revive us, revive us, revive us. Wash and cleanse us with your blood, so we see through the eyes of love. Unite us, 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 unite us. We're awakening the truth to the things we never knew. Oh, help us love like you. My heart is the wick, your love is the flame, and I want to burn for your name. My heart is the wick, your love is the flame, and I want to burn My heart is awake, your love is the flame, and I want to burn for your name. My heart is awake, your love is the flame, and I want to burn Burn for your name. My heart is the wind. Your love is the flame. And I want to 
you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire. You're a I want to be done too. You're a I want to be done You 
take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be satisfied. Purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be satisfied. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Purified. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. Psalm 42. It says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go to the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and from Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love. And at night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight that you are our hope. We thank you tonight that it is your steadfast love that never ceases. It is your mercies that are new every morning. It is your faithfulness that doesn't just keep us, that holds us. And so tonight, as we gather in your house, as your people, I pray that we would set our eyes and our hearts, our lives upon you. I pray, God, that we would be willing to push down those places that are rising up against you so that you can rise up within us. Holy Spirit, we thank you tonight that you dwell in us. Father, thank you for sending the Son. And Jesus, thank you for praying that the Spirit would be sent. Thank you that we are now the temples of God. And so we do not have to ascend unto you, for you have come to dwell with us. And so I pray tonight that we would set our affection and our attention on you, that we would be reminded that you are good and your love endures forever, that we would remind ourselves that you are our joy and our hope and our peace, that we would not try to gather those things which are not for us, but we would let you scatter from us those things that are not ours, so that we could be filled with you. But not only filled, but overflowing. That we would walk in you. That we would be satisfied in you. That we would be confident in you. That we would hunger and thirst after righteousness, believing with all of our heart that you will satisfy our mouths with good things. Thank you that you are a good God. I pray tonight that we would live in your goodness. I pray tonight that we would not allow anything to, dis to distract from just how good you are and that we just like the author of Psalms 42 that we would speak to ourselves in those dark days and say why so downcast oh my soul put your trust in God thank you that you are faithful and trustworthy thank you that you are good may we rest in your mercy in Jesus name I pray amen amen thank you guys you can be seated Joanne is going to come now and lead us in our intercession. Joanne, thank you.
Good evening. <clears throat> um, I'm going to share with you a, a prayer concern from Pakistan tonight. Pakistan is number seven on Open Doors uh, World Watch list 2023. Um, sometime close to the middle of August, um, in a on, on a street in the city of Jarawala, um, there were a couple pages of the Quran found that had been torn out. And there were two brothers who were accused of doing that, and that's the crime of blasphemy, which can be punished by death. Um, the brothers somehow were hidden away, and uh, a few days later, on August 16th, a, a mob um, a, of possibly thousands came into the city and um, came in waves, breaking down um, doors of churches and homes of Christians. And it seems to be a very planned attack because it's churches and Christians' homes that were um, damaged, no, no others in the city. Um, a group of men came and broke down doors, and then people came in um, looking for Bibles, um, which they burned, and crosses, which they broke, um, took even appliances out of homes, and then eventually um, torched uh, the buildings. Um, and so, as you can imagine, um, the the, the church is in a bit of distress and they're scared um, and they're overwhelmed and many of them lost their houses and their churches are burned out. Um, and so we want to want to pray for our brothers and sisters in the midst of this um, really terrible event. Um, you know, Jesus talked um, about his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And we and we get a couple of glimpses of that um, in, in the city. Uh, the, the next Sunday, a few days later, on the 20th, um, open doors, field workers um, found many churches that people had gathered standing on broken glass in burned out buildings with no Bibles, worshiping God. And one field worker who saw a young girl who was sitting on the ground holding together the pieces of a broken cross. And she said to him, they don't know our secret. The cross is here in our hearts. Um, that's the faith of our brothers and sisters in a broken time, in a broken place. And God is inviting us to join him in what he is doing in this situation with our prayers. So let's join him. Lord God, we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. We thank you especially for our brothers and sisters in Jaramwala today. Lord, we thank you that you love them, that they are precious to you, that you are Emmanuel, God, with them. Lord, we are so grateful that you are close to the brokenhearted and you save those who are crushed in spirit. Jesus, we are so grateful that you do not break bruised reeds or put out smoldering wicks. God, thank you that you are a defender and a protector. Thank you that when your people are weak, you are strong. And so, so Lord, we, we pray for our brothers and sisters tonight. We, we pray for those who have lost their houses. Um, we, we pray for those who have left the city. Um, Lord, that you would you would find new places for them, and as they go, they would go bearing the light of Jesus. Um, Lord, we pray for those who are staying, for those who are um, trying to figure out where they're going to stay, who are trying to figure out if it's even possible for them to rebuild their homes. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving for their church buildings. We we think about our building, um, and, and we just think about what that feels like for them to have their, their building destroyed. God, we pray for children who, are, who just are so frightened and don't understand what's going on, that you would allow them to sense you holding them in your everlasting arms of love. Isaiah, give us a picture, Lord, of you holding the little lambs to your heart. We pray that that would be a reality for those children, Lord, that they would sense that happening, that somehow in the midst of the unknown, in the scary, in the in in the things that are frightening people, Lord, that your shalom would reign. God, that your people would feel you, sense you, know that you are surrounding them with songs of deliverance. And God, we thank you that you're going to rebuild your church, whatever that looks like, because your church will not be destroyed. God, as, as terrifying it is, and as heartbreaking as it is to think about 
Bibles being burned. God, we know that your word endures forever. Lord, we know that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not. And so, God, we thank you for that. We pray that Bibles would be available for your people, Lord. Those that lost their Bibles, that there would be more that would be given to them. God, we thank you that you're a God who loves your people so well that even when everything they have in a material sense is gone, they will still gather together to worship you. So Lord, we pray your blessing on our brothers and sisters tonight. God, we pray for those who rampaged this city. God, we pray for those who burned Bibles, who broke crosses. Lord, we pray that you would move in hard hearts, that you would reveal yourself in whatever way you have to, but God, you would reveal yourself as well to your persecuted church there, Lord. That those who inflicted harm would see your goodness and your glory and your kindness would lead them to repentance. That God, from what looks like a disaster to us, would be a seed of salvation and redemption and restoration and revival. Thank you, God, that nothing is wasted in your hands. And so we trust you tonight, and we pray your great blessing on our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Joanne. Amen. Thank God for his faithfulness, for his sovereignty. And as Joanne just prayed, that nothing is wasted. Um, would you, uh, let's take a couple minutes and just in greet and encourage each other tonight. And then uh, in just a couple minutes, we'll come back with a couple announcements and jump right into the scripture.
you guys are like well trained. As soon as somebody walks to the front, everybody stops what they're doing. Maybe I needed a minute. <laughs> so one more time, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for being here tonight. A couple of quick announcements. Um, if you want, you can start turning to John chapter 14. Um, but while you're turning there, a couple of announcements because we have a lot going on over this next week or so. Um, first of all, tomorrow is church picnic, 12 o'clock from 12 to 3 at uh, Burlington Acres. Um, we have the pavilion right behind the police station. Um, so if you're looking for it, find the police station and we will be right behind there. So if you haven't signed up or you have something you want to bring or you don't know what to do, just see PJ and Kai. Um, I can tell you now, I know some of you have been texting and calling Melissa and I. We have no idea what's going on. Uh, so we are we are not doing this. So uh, if you need information or you want to make sure you bring the right thing, talk to PJ and Kai before you leave here tonight. PJ. Thank you. You know what? We'll make sure we put that on Facebook uh, tonight. That way, that way everybody has it. So yeah, 871 Old York Road. A um, couple other things. Tuesday night is Women's Connections Group. Wednesday night is Bible Study. And then Friday night is Brothers in Fellowship uh, Men's Group. If you watch the video, um, I made, made a mistake on the video. This month, it is not at the Mingi's house. It is at the Hamill's house. So it is not in Mount Holly. It is in Langhorn. That's right. I don't know why I almost said uh, Bristol. I'm thinking about the old days. Uh, so it is in uh, Langhorn. So if you need any information on that, you can see Anthony, and he can get you all the uh, information that you might need. So tonight we begin this new series that I've been talking about, Life in the Spirit. And this is a series that I started by saying it might be four weeks. Who knows? Right? It may be the fall. This may turn into the fall, the fall series. But this is a series that I've really been reading about and praying about and trying to work my way through for for a long time, but it really has been highlighted for me for the last few months because we have this incredible promise that the Holy Spirit lives in us. But then at the same time, I think we have a lot of difficulty because I don't know that we know how to live in him. And I know the scriptures tell us how. The scriptures tell us everything we need to know. And yet I think if most of us, and as we go through this, we'll work our way and I'll ask some questions. I think if most of us are honest, we live in him far less than we should, than we're able, than even than we want to. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and we will work our way through it. But I think at the top of the list is we just don't really know how. How do I live in the Holy Spirit? In fact, if we're real honest, we don't even talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot. We, we sort of kind of... He's like the lesser part of the Godhead, and he's not. He's not at all. In fact, he's often not even a he. He's an it somehow. He's like a power rather than a person. And so we don't talk about him. And one of the things that's really been on my heart is I really believe that for a lot of us, we have allowed the abuses we've seen others do in the name of the Holy Spirit to rob us of the abundance that has been promised to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so we've seen things we don't like and we don't understand. And so we have pushed him away rather than coming away with him. We've decided, I don't want that. But what if I were to tell you that's not him anyway? What if I was to tell you that a whole lot of the stuff that you've seen and heard and you don't like, he doesn't like either? And so there's this place where we have to let the scriptures actually do all the speaking so that we can live the way the scriptures have created us to live. So bear with me. We're going to go slow. And it may take a while. Thank you, Ed. And there may be weeks where you don't think we learn anything new. And that's okay with me. Because I think there are some things we've got to really grab hold of. Rather than like pieces and revelations and all this stuff that we often want, there's some truth that we've got to grab hold of. And Jesus promised that the Spirit would lead us, He would guide us into all truth. And all of us need more truth. Because the biggest issue we have is we're not living from the truth. We're living in our feelings. We're living in our flesh. When Jesus ate the Passover meal, 
with his apostles for the last time, what we often refer to as the Last Supper, it says that he took the cup, and when he took it, he said this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. First question tonight, what is the new covenant? Because if we don't grab hold of what the new covenant is, we're never going to understand how to live in it. And if we don't understand what Jesus was offering us, we're going to grab for things that make sense to us, even if they aren't promised to us. Right? We've spent this whole year, we've been reading the Torah. So we've been reading Genesis through Deuteronomy. This week we just finished Leviticus, which is the law spoken by God to Moses, Aaron, and Israel. It is God's covenant with his people. It is really the requirements. It's God saying, here's what is required for an unholy people to live in my holy presence. I will dwell with you, but here's what you have to do to make room for my dwelling. When Jesus took the cup, he said that his blood was making a way for a new covenant. So we've been, we just finished Leviticus, right? We've just finished the basis, the, the foundation, the, the middle of the middle of the old covenant. And then Jesus, sitting there, fulfilling that covenant, says to them, now I'm about to serve you a new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 13 say that Jesus was given a more excellent ministry, making him the mediator of a better covenant with better promises. So again, what is this new, better covenant? In Leviticus, we read God's law for Israel's forgiveness of sins. God made a way. They could not make up for their sins just like we cannot. And so God made a way. The blood of bulls and goats and lambs. The day of atonement where the priest would make sacrifices for himself and his family and then for the entire nation. The scriptures say that those sacrifices made the people clean again. That they made them right with God. That God counted them as holy because of their obedience. But in all of that, there still was a problem. Hebrews chapter 10, 4 says, but it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So that means that in the old covenant, sins could be covered, they could be dealt with, they could even be forgiven, but they could not be removed. So let's stop there for just a minute. How good is God? How kind is God? How merciful is God that even though the blood of bulls could not take away our sins, God said, I will hold back wrath for your sins until I make a way for them to be, to be made. So God's saying, because God gave them blood and God gave them bulls and goats in the law, and God is saying, this won't do the final work, but I'll accept it because I'm going to do the final work. So it's not that something changed along the way. It's that God in his kindness said, I'm going to give you a way to be held, to be kept, to be preserved until I make the final way. So in the old covenant, again, our sins could be covered, but they couldn't be removed. It means that people could be cleansed, but they didn't become new creations. That their only righteousness was still their own righteousness. And we know that that's like filthy rags. The new covenant is not simply Jesus dying for our sins. It's also his resurrection to give us his righteousness. So the old covenant made a way for forgiveness, but not for righteousness. Right? That's the main difference. Or that's one of the main, big differences is the blood can preserve you, but it can't make you righteous. Because there's no righteousness in us. So why was there an annual day of atonement? Because our sins got washed away and we started all over again. That's why it's not really theologically correct when we say, God will give you a clean slate. That's old covenant. Clean slate just means you get to start over again. New covenant is you shall be born again. You will be born from above. I will give you a new heart. We'll read a bunch of these scriptures in just a few minutes. And so there's this main difference. And what is the main difference? It's transformation. The one could not transform us, but it could keep us until transformation would come. Again, the new covenant is not simply Jesus dying for our sins. It's also his resurrection to give us his righteousness. This is why 2 Corinthians 5.21 is so important. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
Jesus did not just die so that our sins could be forgiven. He also rose from the dead so that his righteousness could be counted unto us. So that means that the forgiveness of sins is only the beginning of salvation. The forgiveness of sins is not the gift of salvation. It's not the end of salvation. It's not even the goal of salvation. The forgiveness of sins washes us, it prepares us so that we can put on Christ, so that we can be robed in his righteousness, so that we can be transformed, born again, and made brand new. If all we needed was forgiveness, we had bulls for that. We need more than forgiveness. But salvation doesn't end with us just being new creations. It doesn't just end with our names being written in the book or our place being made for us in heaven. The new covenant had a specific purpose that somehow I think we've either, either lost or diminished our sight of. We were forgiven of our sins and born with water and spirit. We were credited with Jesus' righteousness all so that the Holy Spirit of God could come and live in us. The infilling of the Holy Spirit is not some extra benefit. It is the core of God's desire for fellowship with us. That we would walk with him and he would walk with us. That he would be our God and we would be his people. The purpose of the forgiveness of our sins, the purpose of being robed in righteousness, is so we can be filled with God. That we might become the temples of the Holy Spirit. Salvation is the Holy Spirit coming to live in us. He's not an afterthought. He's not for some and not for and then not for others. He's not simply the dunamis power. He is the gift of the Father. Him in us is the fullness. It's the seal. It's the promise. It is the purpose of our salvation. If we are in Christ, then the Holy Spirit is in us. The new covenant is defined. By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What do we have in the new covenant that was never present in the old? The infilling of the Holy Spirit. There is no example in the old of the Spirit coming and living in people. He came and dwelled on them. He came and empowered them. So here's the thing. We keep settling for the old when we've been invited into the new. We keep wanting power. We keep wanting this. We keep wanting that. And God's saying, I've opened a brand new door. I've torn away the old curtain. You don't need to settle for the power of Elisha. You can have the indwelling of my very spirit. And yet we often get so enamored by what we can see that we devalue what he has spoken, what he has promised. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 through 27 prophesied all this. It says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you of all your filthiness and from all your idols. So there we have forgiveness. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. There we have righteousness. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirits within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. The new covenant is a threefold covenant. It is forgiveness. It is righteousness. It is the indwelling of his spirit. And he forgives and makes righteous so he can fill. Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34 say, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, John the Baptist made way for the Lord with these words, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John announced that his ministry was about repentance and forgiveness, but that Jesus was coming to give the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself in our text tonight in John 14, 17, promised the apostles, the Holy Spirit will be in you. What if the purpose of salvation has nothing to do with going to heaven later? 
What if the purpose of salvation is all about being filled with and living in fellowship with the Holy Spirit right here and right now and forevermore? What if we're forgiven to be filled? And hear me in this for a second, because we all come from different backgrounds. We're, we are a pretty good hodgepodge in here week after week. When I'm talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about living in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit living in us. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues and laying on hands and any of those things. I'm talking about a relationship of fellowship with God through the indwelling Spirit who lives in us, never coming and never going in full measure. He dwells with us because we dwell in Christ. So don't turn off because you think he's talking about this. No, the gifts of the Spirit are such a small part of what the Spirit has promised to do, and yet we have made them the lion's share because we often focus on the smallest parts. I don't know why we do it, but our flesh longs to talk about the littlest pieces while we neglect the foundational stuff. And we wonder why our feet keep slipping. Could it be because we chase stuff that is lesser than the stuff we were meant to stand on? That leads us to the whole purpose of this series. The Holy Spirit lives in us. How do we live in Him? Romans chapter 8 verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So if the same Spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in me, why do I find myself living less than a resurrected life? so often if i have the mind of christ why are my thoughts so scattered if i'm a new creation why do i keep chasing after old things if i'm born from above why do i worry so much about life here below if I'm living in the new covenant with better promises, a better high priest, and a better sacrifice, why am I anxious over and grabbing for all these lesser things? All of that says, the Spirit may be in me, but I'm not often in the Spirit. Thank God it's not for me to go grab Him or call Him to come. It's for me to believe that He's here. It's for me to trust Him. I pray that John 14 will at least start us in the direction of answering some of these questions. On the night of Jesus' arrest, as he was preparing the apostles, not just for his death, but for the new covenant and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he said this to them, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. There is a connection that Jesus makes between the condition of our hearts and our belief in his care. Our belief in his character often determines the condition of our hearts. Do not let your hearts be troubled. So what if we just inserted one word? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Instead, believe in God. Believe also in me. What if I were to tell you tonight that the level of your troubled heart tells you something about the quality of our trust in God? It stings a little bit, right? It's a little uncomfortable. It's a little, how dare you? Who do you think you are? You don't know. And yet, the way Jesus says this connects these two things in a way that I don't think we often make the connection. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. They're two separate things, but one requires the other. And one actually is the solution for the other. We want to immediately fight against this. We want to immediately fight against this idea. We want to say, no, I really do trust God. I just have a problem with worry or anxiety or it's just a really hard time or it's just really this or it's just really that. But isn't this what Jesus is saying? Isn't this what the psalmist was saying in Psalm 43, verse 5, when he says, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why the unease within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Isn't he talking to himself saying, why are you feeling this way? Why are you sitting in this? Why are you allowing for this? Why are you living from this? Put your trust in God. 
We love Mark chapter 9, verse 23, where the father of the demon-possessed young man cried out to Jesus, I believe, help my unbelief. Like, we love that. I love that passage. It, it, it almost is my reason. I'm allowed to have a little unbelief mixed in there. God understands. God knows. But let's not forget that the man only made the statement because Jesus called out his unbelief. The man didn't say, I've got a little unbelief mixed in here, Jesus. The man had made a statement and Jesus had questioned him on what he had said. See, the man had been desperate. His son had been possessed since he was a boy. An evil spirit caused him to have convulsions, to roll around on the ground and foam at the mouth. It had thrown the boy into both fire and water trying to kill him. They had survived all of this. And then when the father heard about Jesus, he brought his son hoping that Jesus could set him free. But when he got there, Jesus wasn't there. Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. So there were some of his apostles there. Ever been in that season in your life where you knew you just had to get to God and when you get there, it's not what you thought it was going to be? Just got to get to that place or that person. Just got to get to that song. I just got to pray that prayer. If I, if I could just get to this, I know everything would be all right only to find out I got there and it's, it's not what it was last time. The man did what most of us would have done. He asked the apostles to cast the demon out. Scriptures tell us that the apostles tried, but they weren't able. And then, as what happens when we don't do what we thought we should have done, an argument broke out. So now, not only is the son not being healed, he's become a spectacle. He's become a reason for an argument. It sort of reminds me of Exodus chapter 5, when Moses first went to Pharaoh to ask him to let the Israel go. And instead of freeing them of their slavery, he increased their workload and he increased their cruelty of their treatment. So the people then were sorry they'd ever listened to Moses. They wished he would have they would have never heard anything from Moses. And Moses prayed this prayer. God, you have not delivered your people at all. Ever felt that way? Ever felt like God hasn't done at all what you had asked him to do, what you expected him to do, what he's supposed to do? I prayed, I've waited, I've, I've done everything I was supposed to do, and you haven't fulfilled your promise. The disappointment and discouragement, even disconnection. See, disappointment and discouragement quickly turn into anger and resentment if we don't guard our hearts. If we don't do the work of guarding our hearts, we find ourselves accusing God of not doing what he promised when the truth is he, didn't simp he simply didn't do what we wanted. Or didn't do it in the time we expected or through the people we had planned basically all we're saying it's a little bit of a tantrum if we want to be really honest about it so we're throwing a little bit of a fit that god is not doing what i think he should do because ultimately it's not that god hasn't answered us it's that our circumstances have now shown that we aren't trusting him because if I only trust him when he does what I think he's supposed to do, who's actually in charge? If I only give him praise when he does what I asked him to do, who's actually in charge? If I, if I have the ability and the freedom to get angry and disappointed every time he doesn't work the way I wanted him to, am I not saying God is my God doing what I think he should do? Rather than me saying, but I am his child, trusting whatever he chooses to do. The father in Mark 9 explained all these things to Jesus when he finally came down the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he said to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus immediately responds to him and says, if you can. And it's, it's sharp. Like if you read the way it's written, it's sharp. Je Jesus heard what he said. You know, Lord, if you're willing, Jesus says, if, if you can. All things are possible for one who believes. See, what we find in the Father is that much as he had faith, the trouble that was going on in his heart was eroding his belief in God. And I'm going to say this again. The level of trouble in our hearts tells us something about the quality of our belief in God. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The word that we translate as troubled in the Greek means to stir or agitate to trouble. It's used 17 times in the New Testament, and every time it's used except one instance, and that was at the pool of Bethesda, it's always describing the condition of our hearts when something unexpected 
unwanted or not understood happens. Is there anything worse than the unexpected, the misunderstood, and the unwanted? Like, is there anything that unravels us faster than not getting our way or things going far differently than we thought that they were going to go? This is when we're told, don't let your hearts be troubled. It's the word that describes the fear of Zacharias when he saw the angel Gabriel. Or the panic of the apostles when they saw Jesus walking on the water toward them and thought that he was a ghost. It actually also describes the grief of Jesus' heart as he prepared himself to face the betrayal of Judas. And in the specific case of John 14, 1, it was Jesus telling the apostles not to allow the anxiety and disappointment of God's ways, not being their ways, to trouble their heart. The feelings, the experiences of fear, doubt, grief, disappointment, anger, and anxiety, they're all real. And they can't be avoided. And they don't need to be rejected. But we can't allow them to diminish our view of God's heart. We can't allow them to to, to diminish who God says that he is. And yet that's all they want to do. Every time we're afraid, we wonder where God is. Every time we're anxious, we wonder what God's doing. Every time we're disappointed, we wonder why God hasn't done what we want Him to do. And all of those things are just diminishing our view of God. That's their purpose. That's what they want to do. And so what Jesus is saying is, don't let your heart be troubled. Keep your eyes on on me. Keep your heart set on my character. Keep your heart set on my work. We cannot allow those places to have control of our lives. Because if we do, they'll then take control of our faith. And we will talk about things we're not living in. We'll say things to others that we actually don't believe within ourselves. Over the last few years, I've been confronted with the reality that I am a much more anxious person than I've ever wanted to admit. God has a way of showing you things about yourself that you don't know. We like when he shows us the really good stuff. Like we like when God says, you know what? You're more faithful than you think you are. You're more generous than you think you are. But when he says, you're much more anxious than you think you are. Our first response is, no, I'm not. Even when it's God, our first response is, that must just be me. That's just my flesh. That's the enemy. That that can't be the work of God. For me, it all started a few years ago when a a friend asked me how I was doing, and I decided to go ahead and tell him. Because I don't know about any of you other men, but most of the time when someone asks how you're doing, it's mostly just courtesy, and we're going to keep moving, because you don't really want to know, and I don't really want to tell you. But for some reason, this friend of mine said, how are you? And I decided that day, you know what? I'm going to tell you how I am. After I shared some things that were going on both in my mind and my heart and in my life, how I was feeling about different things, my friend asked me this simple question, how long have you been anxious? My friend, I I may as well throw this out there, my friend is a rabbi, and he never actually answers a question, he just asks more questions. Like, there's never a time where he just says, yes, he always just says, well, what about? And so he said, how long have you been anxious? To which I responded, I'm not anxious. Never, never been a really, I've I've never been an anxious person. And then he just asked this. He said, if one of your church members had shared these things with me and and he repeated all the things I had said to him, would you think that they were dealing with anxiety? So at that point, I told him to shut up. (laughs) Because we didn't need to go any further. I'll be honest, some of my anxieties are funny. I'm convinced that Uber is just an easy way to get murdered. We grew up being told never to get in a stranger's car, and now there is an app where we call the strangers, tell them where we are, and say, come pick me up, take me where I want to go, or murder me, whichever you decide to do. You will never catch me on Uber. And if you do, I'm being murdered. I promise you that's what's going on. You all know about my issues with bridges. We've talked about that enough times. But for every anxiety that's silly or even ridiculous, there are a whole lot that are serious. When Noah first started driving, I was constantly worried about him, which most of your parents in the room will say, that's normal, that's okay. But when I really struggled was when he took Elijah somewhere. Because at that point, my mind then raced to what if something happens to both of them? 
How would I handle it if something happened to both of them at once? Every time I travel, I write letters to my wife and my sons just in case I don't come back. My wife just realized that's why I write the letters. Just a couple months ago, she said something about the letters. I said, oh yeah, those are in case I died. She's like, what? No, 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 don't. And she's like, don't, don't write any more letters then. But that's, honestly, that's, I, I write a letter to each one of them before I travel anytime, just in case I don't come back. I worry about the building, if it'll ever get done. I worry then about if we even did the right thing in buying it. I fight not to worry every time there is a dip in attendance at church, questioning if we're doing the right thing, if what we're doing is pleasing to God, or if we're just in here doing whatever it is that we want to do. I am ridiculously anxious if anyone other than me drives. And it's not even because I think I'm a great driver. It's just that at least when I'm driving, I'm, not, I'm in control. I've told Melissa a thousand times, if I'm going to die in the car, I want it to be my fault, not yours. Some of these things make no sense. Some of them make a lot of sense, but all of them are robbing me. See, the reality that I'm coming to grips with is that my worry affects my sleep on a weekly basis. It affects my relationships. It, I'm sure it affects my health, but most of all, what the Lord has been speaking to my heart is that my anxiety is diminishing my faith. My anxiety is robbing me of seeing the goodness of God in uncomfortable places. It's lying to me about who God is, and it's pushing me to live from my weaknesses rather than in His strength. Maybe yours is too. So the sin is not that I'm anxious. It's that my anxiety wants me to think less of God. We keep trying to make it a sin issue. It's not. It's a worship issue. And so my anxiety is not saying, go sin, go sin, go sin. My anxiety is saying, God's not as big as you need him to be. God's not as good as you need him to be. God's not as close as you need him to be. God isn't loving you the way you need to be loved. It's all trying to shrink who God is. And most of all, it's making me completely unaware that the Holy Spirit is living in me. It's making me completely unaware that the same spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in me. And so my, my mortal body's not being quickened because my anxiety has all of my attention. So over the last year, probably longer than that, I've been actively asking God, if the Holy Spirit lives in me, why do I so often live in and from my anxiety? If I am in Christ, if I am a new creation, transformed, born again, if I am the temple of the Holy Spirit, why do I seem to live from old ways, old thoughts, old plans, and old understanding? And what I'm learning is that for many of us, the source of our anxiety is not what's happening to us. It's us. It's not the circumstance. It's us. It's who we are. It's, it's what we haven't yielded. It is our flesh. It is the stuff of earth competing for the allegiance of the things of heaven, as Rich Mullins wrote. There's this place in us where we keep thinking, if I would feel better, I wouldn't be worried. If you had a better job, you wouldn't be worried. If the kids were more obedient, we wouldn't be worried. And the reality is, what the Spirit's been showing me about myself is, you're being a worrier. And no matter what the situation is, you're choosing to be something you've been freed from. See, the problem's not my circumstances. It's not Uber. It's not Melissa's driving. This issue is the condition of my heart. I'm the problem. I don't need to overcome anxiety. I need to overcome myself. I need to overcome what the Bible calls the flesh. Which most of us, and if you read the King James Version, you've always thought of the flesh as the sinful stuff. The flesh is the human stuff. It's not necessarily sinful. It's just the way you've always thought and the way you've always acted and the things you've always been afraid of and the things you've always expected and experienced and assumed. It's all of that stuff that didn't come from heaven, so it can't accomplish heaven's purpose. I overcome all of this. Really, we overcome anything that we ever overcome simply by trusting God. Sounds really simple. Jesus even said it this way to Jairus. Just believe. And how many times have we heard somebody say, just believe, just trust God. And our first thought is, I'm trying. There's a work that has to be done, right? 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, but they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. There is some work that's involved. It's not just this, you know, the blood of Jesus, the word of my testimony. I've got to believe it. I've got to actually believe in the power of the blood. I have to actually believe in the word of my testimony. See, I'd rather have God just take away the trouble so that I can trust in him. Like if you'd take the trouble, I would trust you fully. If I didn't feel this way, if this was just gone, it would be easy to trust you. And I hate to admit it, but I find myself like the people of Capernaum in John chapter 6. They had eaten the miraculous meal that Jesus had provided. They recognized that he was the Messiah. They referred to him from Deuteronomy as the prophet. They wanted to make him the king. They chased after him. And the next day when they saw him, they said, what sign will you do so that we can believe? He had fed 5,000 of them. And that was just the men. So who knows how many the total was with women and children from five loaves and two fish. That had been enough of a sign that they wanted to make him the king. He had gotten to the other side of the sea without a boat. And they recognized that. Remember, when they got there, they said, Lord, how did you get here? But when he told them that what God desired was that they believe, that they trust him, that they yield to and submit their hearts and their minds and their lives, that's when they then said, so then what are you going to do to prove that we can believe you? Let's be honest, we're not that much different. We're not that much different. Like, we read it in hindsight and we go, what's wrong with them? They still had the bread in their teeth and they're already, and they're, and they're already saying, what will you do next? What's wrong with them? But we're not that much different. God has been so good to me. I could give you a long list, and I mean a long list, of the ways that he's been kind and patient and loving toward me. Yet far more often than I like to admit, I live more from my trouble and anxiety than I do my belief in his goodness and his mercy. It's not a battle I'm losing. It's one that I don't often even participate in. I just give in to how I've been, how I feel, or how, what I'm thinking. And then... And counseling is an excellent thing, but then sometimes counseling just tries to point to how we got here, not where we go from here. And so now I can look at it and I can say, well, you know what? I can explain how I got here. My, my parents were like this, or, my, or this happened to me then, or that. That's all true stuff, but it doesn't get me out of it. In some ways, it sometimes sends me back to it or gives me reasons that I can acknowledge. Yeah, this is why I'm this way. And yet here's the truth, but the Spirit of God lives in me. If the Spirit of God lives in me, I don't have to live less than. I don't ever have to choose less than. I don't ever have to lay down in what someone else, in a pit somebody else dug for me. The Spirit of God lives in me. I can come out of this if I'll choose to trust Him in it. How many times do we basically say to God, what will you do to prove that I can trust you? In John 14, Jesus knew that the apostles' hearts would be troubled, and so he gave them two commands. Don't give control of your hearts to your hearts and believe in me. The two things work together. I can't believe in God without controlling my heart, and I can't control my heart without believing in God. In Exodus 13, a passage that you guys know because I talk about it so often, God led Israel out of Egypt toward the promised land. It says that they went the long way because God knew that their anxiety over battle was greater than their trust in Him as the Deliverer. How many long ways have we been living in because our anxiety was greater than our faith? And God knew it. And he's generous, and he's kind, and he's merciful, and he's patient. How many long seasons of our lives where we say, how long, oh Lord? And he's saying, as soon as you trust me, as soon as you hand this thing to me, as soon as you'll acknowledge this thing to me, I am ready. Abraham, I'm ready to give you a son. David, I'm ready to make you king. Israel, I'm ready to get you to the promised land. As soon as you set your anxieties aside, I'm ready. And yet we keep trying to follow him and carry that stuff at the same time. It's almost like we pray with one eye open to see if anything's going to actually happen rather than believing that he is our good God. Scripture says that they were armed for battle, meaning that God had provided everything they needed to be victorious, but at the same time they were afraid of war. And so what did God do? Armed for battle, afraid of war. Man, how often do we live there? 
How often do we live there? Filled with the Holy Spirit, afraid of everything that's going on around us. Filled with the Holy Spirit, afraid of death. Filled with the Holy Spirit, afraid of failure. Filled with the Holy Spirit, afraid of looking foolish. Filled with the Holy Spirit, afraid of being left alone. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit, but afraid that our desires won't be met. Every time you feel that way, go to Exodus 13. Because we're just Israel. And there's nothing wrong with that. We just have to come out from it. And so what does God do for Israel? Thank God, a couple of things. Number one, he's not easily offended. So he doesn't crush them. He also doesn't send them into battle. He doesn't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you face your fear and send them into battle like I might have. He doesn't get as worked up about our weaknesses as, as we do. And I mean other people's weaknesses. We have a tendency not to get worked up about our weaknesses, right? We have a tendency to explain ours and then get really irate over everybody else's. And God doesn't get worked up over our weaknesses. He just shows us his strength. In Exodus 13, 21 and 22, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. So God gave them an answer for their fears. He made his presence visible with them. Every moment of every day. When they woke up in the morning, they could look out and say, God's still here. When they closed their eyes to go to sleep, they could look out their tents and say, God's still here. He was with them always, every moment of the journey. But they still had to do the work of trusting him, of believing that his presence was a promise, that he would be with them in trouble, not that he would keep them from trouble. And yet we have believed a gospel that says, if God is good, bad things won't happen. That if God is good, he'll give me everything that I desire. If God is good, I'll never get sick. If God is good, my kids will always behave. If God is good, the church will always be full. If God is good, I'll get what I want. And that's not at all what the scriptures have ever taught us. Philippians chapter 2, or chapter, I think it's chapter 1, the Apostle Paul tells the people of Philippi, says, you have been called to believe in Jesus and to suffer. That's not a calling a lot of us are asking for, right? I want to be called, I want to be called to, you know, Lord, I'll be the one called to wealth and, and health. I, I can handle that calling. Paul said that the only way to enter into the kingdom of God is through persecutions through trials, through struggling, through difficulty. See, so what do we see that God does with Israel? He led them in the way that they had to trust Him. He didn't rob them of their fears. He didn't strip their fears off of them. He led them in the way where they had to trust Him. But He he didn't send them up against enemy armies. He led them into ways where they had to trust Him. Where they had to experience that His ways were higher than theirs. God led Israel to go toward the Red Sea. At the same time, he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And so while Israel is going, being backed into a corner, Egypt's armor, army is coming after Israel. So they have nowhere to escape. But remember, it's all God's doing. It was all by God's design. Can I ask a really tough question tonight? What if this place that you hate right now is all God's design? What if this place where you feel pressed, where you feel like you're being robbed, where you feel like everything you hope for isn't coming to you, what if it's all God's design? What if this is what he's doing for you, not what is happening to you? Are we, is there anything in us that's willing to say, you know what, God, your ways are higher than mine. Maybe I need to look at this from a different angle. Maybe I need to look at this rather than from my disappointment, look at it from your goodness, from your character. God tested their anxious thoughts, to use Psalm 139's language. He allowed their greatest fear to be tested so that he could, they could see that he was greater than all of their fears. But they had to believe. Right? They had to yield. And so do we. I'm not going to do a deep dive because we've studied this passage so many times and most of you know exactly what happened. They come to the edge of the Red Sea. Israel's army is chasing them after them. They cry out to Moses, was it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? Moses cries out to God and God says, why are you crying out to me? Which is one of my favorite little sidebars in all of Scripture. Where you have an army chasing, you have a sea in front, there's nothing to do, there's nowhere to go. Moses cries out to God and God says, why are you calling out to me? And then he just says, 
Hold up your staff. The thing I gave you long ago, in fact, the thing you were hoping you didn't have to carry anymore, the thing that you used to be ashamed of, the thing that used to be your mark of failure, hold it up. And when he does, the Red Sea opens and Israel goes through on dry ground and then God closes it and the army of Egypt is destroyed. And it says that they sang and they danced and they rejoiced. And then they moved on following the cloud. And a few days after that, they ran, they got to a place where they had no clean water. And they said, we're going to die of thirst. And so God cleans the water and they move on. And a few days later, they run out of food and they say, we're going to die of hunger. And so God sends manna. Do we see the cycles of our lives in them that God keeps answering and we keep crying that God keeps doing what we need and we keep saying when are you going to do what I want that every time we face the next trouble we almost forget the last provision the last act of kindness Every single difficulty they faced was God leading them into their anxiety to teach them that they could trust him. What if he's doing the same thing in our lives? In fact, why wouldn't he be doing the same thing in our lives? He stirs the unbelief that is hiding in our hearts so that he can free us from it by teaching us to believe in him. They had a cloud. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. There are again times where we would say, but if I had a cloud, you have more than a cloud. We have more than a cloud. We have the living power, the living spirit of God dwelling in us. He leads us into all truth. But the way to truth is always often found through trouble. The same way that they looked at the cloud, we're supposed to look and believe in the spirit who dwells within us and be comforted and be built in confidence. As John chapter 14 continued, the apostles asked questions just like you and I would have. Probably like you and I are asking in some parts of our lives. Questions that are birthed in our anxiety. Jesus said, you know the way to where I'm going. So Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Then it was Philip's turn to be anxious. Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. At that point, Jesus says, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? I feel like God could ask me that question on any given day. Any given day, God could say, A.B., have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? I've seen him work. I've experienced his power. I know his love. I'm saved by his blood. I'm filled with his spirit. But I often live from my heart. Do you know what that means? And I'm just, I'll say it about me so that you don't get mad. It means I don't believe him. We've got to start coming to grips with what things really mean instead of softening them so that we can get away with them. It literally means I don't believe him. It doesn't mean I'm unsaved. It means I don't believe in him the way he deserves to be believed in him. I'm not following him the way he deserves to be followed. I'm even not loving him the way he deserves to be loved. Not the way I was created to believe. And not in the way that I've been invited to believe. Not in the way I need to believe. I keep living from my flesh. Even though I'm filled with his spirit. In John 14, Jesus went on to tell his unsure, anxious, troubled apostles the cure for the weakness of their hearts and the weakness of ours. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you. Stop there for a second. How did he dwell with them? In Jesus. So they had seen the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus. So you will know him because he has been with you in me. But then Jesus takes us to the best news of all, and he will be in you. In all my anxiety, the Holy Spirit lives in me. But so often I'm not living in him. I know we know this, but I have to keep saying it. The Holy Spirit lives in us. 
the literal, actual Spirit of God. The Spirit who hovered over the waters of creation. The Spirit who sat on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. The Spirit who rested on Jesus at His baptism and filled the believers at Pentecost. He lives in us right here and right now. He's not coming and we don't have to ask Him to come. We have the full measure of Him living in us. At some point, I have to do the work of believing in Him. Or I'm never going to overcome the power of my heart. The full measure. John 3 says, He gives His Spirit without measure. The full measure of the Holy Spirit. All of Him. The fullness of God lives in me. So why do I keep living in my flesh? Jesus said, maybe we just need to know more about the flesh. Jesus said in John 6, 63 and 64, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Again, he's not talking about your sin. He's talking about your humanity. So can I tell you some hard things tonight? Your belief about how it should be is of no help at all. Your strength is of no help at all. Your plan is of no help at all. Your way of doing things is of no help at all because it's the flesh. It's us doing the best we can. Haven't you ever, haven't you ever had somebody work with you that is of no help at all? Don't they at some point go from no help at all to getting in the way completely? I, I used to, we used to joke that my, my younger brother, he's only four years younger than me, but my younger brother was of no help at all when it came to moving anything. In fact, there were times where I would just figure out a way to move it myself because I would say, you're just in the way at this point. Not only are you not helping, you're in the way. What if I tell you that's your thoughts, that's your strength, that's your desires, that's your plans, that's your skills, that's your talents, that's all the things that you and I have been depending on. The way I thought it would go is in the way. It's in the way of how God wants to work. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. When I'm living in my own strength and leaning on my own understanding, trusting in my own wisdom and holding on to my own desires, not only am I living in my flesh and doing no help to myself at all, I'm not believing and trusting in God's goodness and I'm not yielding to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I have to do the work of believing. So real quickly, and we'll move on to this more next week, what does that work look like? Let me start to answer that question by asking another one. What if all of our anxieties are simply places where we're still leaning on our own understanding? What if all of our anxieties are just places where we're walking in our desires and working in our own strength? So let me ask this one. What if our anxiety is not an attack of the devil? What if it is a signal? What if it is a signal from the Spirit in us trying to call us to trust Him? A signal that we are not trusting God, that we are making room for the flesh, that we are conforming to the pattern of the world, that we are letting our hearts be troubled. What if anxiety is not something you need to get rid of? It's something that you and I need to start saying, when I feel that, I need to run to Him. That this is an alarm that is sounding, right? A fire alarm doesn't cause fires, but it teaches you how to overcome fires. What if the anxiety isn't causing your problems, but it's teaching us that we're not trusting in God in the midst of our problem? Wouldn't this mean that fighting anxiety is done by yielding to the Spirit? Wouldn't that mean that fighting anxiety is yielding to the Spirit? Wouldn't that mean that the only way to overcome the flesh is to believe in the character of God? Doesn't that mean, once again, that the work that is required, that the work that pleases God, the work that sets us free, is to believe in who God says that He is and what God's doing, whether it's what we wanted or expected or not? What if our anxiety is trying to tell us to trust God because we are too busy doing it our way to hear the Spirit's voice? Before Jesus called us to abide in John 15, he commanded us to believe in John 14. If we are going to walk in the Spirit, we are going to have to learn how to believe that the Spirit lives in us. 
Rather than fighting every fear, every anxious thought, every disappointed moment, every bitter or proud attitude, what if we use those moments as a call to trust God more, a call to declare His goodness and His love and His sovereignty over our hearts and our lives? What if we stopped in those places and recognized those feelings as signals that we are not trusting God, that we're depending upon our flesh? And what if we said along with the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who rescues your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. What if every time we felt overcome by anxiety, we fought anxiety with praise? What if we counted our blessings? What if we actually listed all the times he'd rescued us? What if we actually started declaring to ourselves where he was good when we didn't see goodness, where he was patient, where we didn't see patience, where he was kind when we didn't feel kindness? What if we actually did the work of believing and told ourselves what is true rather than listening to what we know couldn't possibly? What if instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, we felt good about God? Last week, and I'm finishing, I promise. But Ed told me I could take my time. (laughs) Last week, I had a, a minor medical procedure. Nothing serious, but it's the kind of thing that makes me really, really anxious. It involved an IV and anesthesia and all the rest. As they were getting me prepped, they took my vitals and told me that my blood pressure was was a bit high, but nothing dangerous. And then the nurse said, it's probably just the anxiety of being here. She nailed that one. After they gave me the IV and left me to wait to be taken in for the procedure, I could feel my anxiety rising higher and higher. And because God's been working through a lot of this stuff in me, I knew he wasn't going to keep me from it but he was inviting me to walk with him through it. And so as I laid there by myself, I made a conscious decision to do two things. First one, slow down and breathe. And then the second one was to quote Psalm 56, verse 3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. prayed it a few times and then I quoted a few times and then I prayed real simply, Lord, I am afraid. These are the kind of situations that make me anxious. I know everything's going to be all right. I know it's not that big of a deal, but I put my trust in you. It wasn't magical. Didn't sudden, I didn't suddenly feel ready to take on the world, but I did feel my heart slow down. And I did see my thoughts start to shift from what could go wrong to all the things that God had kept me through and loved me in the midst of. See, I think we keep trying not to be afraid, but the scripture says, when I am afraid. See, the work is not fighting fear. The work is trusting God. It's trusting God in our fear. The real work is believing Him while our blood pressure is rising. The real work is believing Him when it seems like our our, our answer isn't coming, where it seems like our body's not responding, when it seems like our promise isn't getting closer, when it seems like things aren't going the way we thought we would in the time we thought it was. The real calling is not to not be afraid, it's to trust God. When I feel afraid, I put my trust in you. For the first time in one of those situations, I did the work of believing. And the Holy Spirit didn't come rushing in because he'd been living in me all along. And so rather than having some great experience where I was no longer anxious about the procedure, I was able to rest in knowing he was in me in the midst of the procedure. Life in the Spirit begins with believing that the Spirit's in us. And it begins with believing it not theologically and not mentally, but believing it practically in the depths of our heart. It is telling ourselves that. And I have to ask us tonight, do we truly believe the Holy Spirit lives in us? And again, all of us have been in church long enough that we're going to say, yeah, absolutely. But do we believe it right now? 
in this moment, in this situation, in this stage of life, that the Holy Spirit lives in us. I'm not calling out any situations because I don't want to embarrass anybody or I don't want to hurt anyone's heart. But in the situations I know some of you are sitting in, I know some of you are wrestling in, I know some of you are weeping over, and they are difficult situations. But in those places right now tonight, do we believe that the Holy Spirit lives in us in these places? See, before we can talk about fighting the flesh or using the gifts of the Spirit or walking in His power, we have to believe in His presence. If we are going to live in Him, we must believe with our whole hearts that He lives in us. Are we willing to begin to do the work of believing? Because it's twofold. Do not let your heart be troubled. That means I've got to start being honest about what's going on in me. And I have to believe that his indwelling is greater than my turmoil. And that he will set my heart at peace. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for asking the Father to send us the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for answering Jesus' prayer and sending the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in us. Thank you that right here, right now, if we were in Christ, you were in us. Thank you that you are not some power. Thank you that you are not some language. Thank you that you are not some action or activity. Thank you that you are the person of God and you live in me. Thank you that this is what you created us for. This was your heart's desire in Eden. Un, unbroken fellowship. And we broke it and you somehow, in your kindness, are restoring it. Father, forgive us tonight for the fact that whenever we're disconnected, it's us. You don't come and go. You don't shrink and magnify. You are steady. You are dependable. You are faithful. You are sure. You are in us. And so, Lord, tonight I just pray that you would begin to teach us to believe that the Spirit dwells in us. Teach us to believe and to live in you the same way that you live in us. Teach us tonight, Holy Spirit, how to yield. Teach us how to surrender, to submit, to obey. But again, before we can do any of those things, teach us to believe. And so, Lord, tonight for any of my friends that are similar to me and they're feeling anxious, teach us to live in you. In the middle of this. Teach us to declare what your word says. While we don't understand. What the world's doing. Teach us to wake up. Every day. Confident that the cloud hasn't moved. That the spirit. Still dwells. That he abides. Lord do the work. Of teaching us. To do the work. Of believing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we close tonight, there's just there's one thing I want to ask you to do. I don't do it often, but I love, I love sermon homework. Some of these things that we're talking about starting tonight, right? Believing. Elementary. And yet, it is the work. And so we sometimes convince ourselves that we know this. And yet, if we look at our lives, we're not doing it whether we know it or not. And so can I encourage you to do something this week, starting tonight, whatever your prayer time is. Would you pray that prayer that I just prayed? Would you thank, would you thank Jesus for praying that, that the Father would send the Spirit? Would you thank the Father for sending the Spirit, for answering Jesus' prayer? And would you thank the Holy Spirit for living in you? Something happens when we start being thankful for things we've been distant from that it brings us near to them. And it begins making us aware of things that we know in our heads but have not been living in our hearts. And I really believe it's not the answer. It's 
It's the gift. The gift of God is that we can live in him the same way that he lives in us. So would you stand with me tonight? And I just want to speak a benediction over you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here tonight.